Aloha all my paranormal people, LeVec here, your paranormal guy. Uh, like I told you before, Missing 411, this is a very good book. Uh, as I stated before, I was going to be doing a lot of reading of this book, and I'm pretty far in uh, to uh, a lot of the chapters in the book about the cases of these missing children and men and women. Um, and I told you that if I had the time, I would get back with you guys with some of the cases from this book. Um, there's one particular case that astounds me that uh, David Paulinus has uh, definitely mentioned in a lot of his interviews, starting with a little boy named Keith Parkins. Um, he went missing on 1452 noon time in Ritter, Oregon. At that time, he was at the age of two. Um, that was around, that was, you know, like I said, when he disappeared. Um, now the case, it occurred in Northern Oregon, but it appears, uh, uh, in that, in a certain area, in that area because of its proximity to the Southeast Washington cases. Okay, uh, and when I say it appears here, meaning in, uh, that part of Oregon. Uh, now, at the age of two, Keith Parkins visited his grandparents, uh, uh, his grandparents farm outside of Ritter, Oregon. Uh, now, Ritter itself is located in the far northeast corner of the state, <coughs> uh, of the of the fringe of the Umatilla National Forest and the Bridge Creek Wildlife Area. His grandparents' residence is located in a, in a very rugged country. In very uh, rugged country, uh, close to the North Fork of the John D. River. Uh, the story of Keith Perkins is one of the most unusual cases I've ever seen myself, uh, uh, and one of the most unusual cases you actually read in this book. Um, but you know, the exact cause of his death is still unknown to this day, so it's very unclear. Now, according to the to the uh, the newspaper clippings, uh, from what was being said, he wandered away from his grandparents' home. That much was evident. Um, a call was made to the law enforcement agencies in that area, and uh, they got a very large response from all that. Keith went missing at noon on a Wednesday, and the search went through Wednesday night. Uh, this is where the story gets a little murky. Uh, a lot murky, a lot of them, it gets very murky actually. Uh, the search went on for like, uh, the search went on for that two year old lost boy in the mountains. Well, a search for a two year old, a two year old in those mountains would normally be confined to a one or two mile radius because, um, or a ra uh, two mile radius from the residence because it is theorized from people who have two year old kids that a child can only travel for no more than one to two miles, tops, because of their little legs and the fact that they're so young. Now, unless whatever this thing is that is taking these kids somehow amps up their energy and their agility to make them run or walk these crazy miles to get to be found in these areas where they're almost dead or dead, I don't know, that's just my theory, you know, but, um, this search here, it, that, that's not what it was about. It wasn't all about. It, it went a, a lot further than that. I mean, we're talking about cold temperatures of 95%. Uh, um, cold temperatures was like, I'm talking like in the mountains, you know, you're probably going to be like 20 below at that point. So 90% of all missing child, uh, missing children between one and three years old are found within two miles in the rural, loca in rural locations. Uh, Let's see, for some unknown reason, the search, the searchers actually knew exactly where to go uh, when they came to find this boy. So that's, that's another crazy part. How is it that they knew to go that far to find this kid? You know, so that, that's one thing that really makes this case weird, you know. So they know something, but they don't want to tell nobody. Um, this boy traveled a very unbelievable an unbelievable distance. Now, around April 10th in the 1952 article, in the 1952, 1952 article of the Lewiston Daily Record reported the following. 
a, a little boy who ran and stumbled over a dozen miles in 19 hours was found unconscious uh, this Thursday morning and is expected to recover. So yes, he went 12 miles in under 19 hours. Now that to me would seem to be very impossible for someone that young, you know, with those little legs. Because if he was to travel that far, his feet would have been destroyed. Now that's another crazy thing. They never mentioned the condition of his feet in the report. So that's that's another thing. Why wouldn't you do that knowing that you got a family who's looking for their kid? So um, let's see. Now, the thing about him also, like I said, he was found unconscious in the creek bed, too. Okay, but uh, when he was examined, he was found uh, with many scratches on his entire body, and he was taken to the hospital. Now, he suffered from, they said that he suffered from uh, exposure, but he lived. It was a mild case of exposure. Um... On April 12th, the same newspaper printed an article stating the following. His mother said the boy has apparently forgotten his night of horror. His pants, she said, were torn to shreds and he climbed through fences and brush in, you know, in the mountains. Another newspaper clipping stated uh, that Keith Parkins had to climb numerous fences, cross icy creeks, and climb at least two mountains to get to the location where he was eventually found. We're talking about two or three mile ranges, okay? Elevation is probably a couple of thousand feet on each one. And that's a lot of ground to cover for some of that age. Now he had to either been carried there or, or he slipped through some pocket within the area and he came out on the other end. So who knows what this could all be. Uh, now, his father stated that, you know, the boy must have ran almost continuously to cover that amount of ground. Now, like I said, that is a very crazy story, you know, and I don't know any child that can go that far. Cross two mountain ranges, a field, and a bunch of fences, creeks, and brush to where his body gets shredded with a lot of scratches. You know, it's, it just doesn't make any sense, you know. Uh, so, this is a very unusual case. Very unusual case. So, like I said, now my theory, I'm sorry about that, that glare is going to be on my glasses. My theory on you know, this, this whatever it is, whatever it is, has the ability to know the human psyche. It knows how, when, and where to take someone. But they take them in such a way that our brains cannot comprehend. They somehow open up a door for them to walk right into. Okay, for them to disappear within an eye shot, just like that, within uh, within a couple of seconds, just like the Dior Kuntz story and what the grandfather said. He turned his head for a second, looked back, and he vanished. So they could be standing still. And whatever this thing is, just snatches them up in a way that is so unheard of to the human mind that we just can't comprehend how that's even done. You know, somehow they must be, they open up, or do they have the ability or the power to open up doorways wherever they want to snatch these people up and they just get sucked into it. You know, or they cover them with this, this energy that cloaks them around, that cloaks the environment around them. To make it look like they haven't gone anywhere. I don't know. It's, it's weird. But it has such an intelligence that it knows how to trick us. It knows that we're not going to figure these things out. We may find facts into the disappearance, but we're not going to figure out how it's done, who did it. Because every single case that David Pauletius has actually talked about or wrote about, not, all of them have 100% accuracy, ac accuracy. I'm sorry. Every single case. And how they, how they actually disappeared or well, found it was done with 100% accuracy. And I think they also have the power to to actually make you experience pain that can't be detected on the body. Just like the, uh, I can't forget his name, um, uh, the guy with the weird uh, voicemail. Um, 
what's his name? Um, Henry McCabe. Henry McCabe. Now, when he had that, when he sent that voicemail out to his wife's phone in California, okay, um, it was weird. All they heard was him. You actually could hear him talking. I think in his own language. They said he was. Um, uh, I forgot what they said he was from, but he was a uh, African. He was of African descent. Uh, you can hear him talking over the phone, but it was very muffled. You really couldn't understand a word he was saying unless he was speaking in his own language. And then all of a sudden, you heard moans and groans, like he was in some severe pain. And then all of a sudden, you hear a growl. And then after that, the phone goes dead. And then you hear it again. You still hear him moaning and groaning. And then you hear someone say, stop it. Now, that's the crazy part because they don't, they don't, they don't play that part in the, the video, in the, the, um, the recording that they put on, on Facebook and on YouTube. They never show that part or, or let you listen to it for some strange reason, okay? But there's a, there's a lot more to that recording than we're being let on to know about, okay? So but that's another thing about him. When they found his body in that creek bed, there was no sign of torture. There was no sign of a struggle. There was no blood. There was no stab wounds, no gun, uh, no, no, no bullet holes, nothing. You know, there was no signs of strangulation on his neck either. So he was just this lifeless corpse. Now, to me personally, I think that whatever it is that's taking these people, even if you didn't go anywhere, somehow, some way, they can suck the life out of your body. Or drain you to the point where you don't even have enough energy to just stay alive. And if you just die, then they just leave you marked for dead right there. You know, because I mean, for you to be found dead with no sign of death on your body at all. Or, but at the same time, you, they find GHB in your system, which is a chemical base that they find in the date rape drug. The date rape drug. You know, so it's weird. And yet, the man can't, they said the man did come from a bar and they said he was drunk. You know, and the, uh, his friends dropped him off at this gas station. Uh, I forgot the name of it. But here's the funny part. The bar that he came from, I think it was like a bar girl place. The place shut down shortly after he went missing and was found dead. Nah, that 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 makes that, that sounds weird to me too. Why would you shut down like that just because someone went missing that came from your bar? It's not like he was killed inside the bar. I can understand that you shut, you had to be shut down for that, you know, but to shut down and change the name of the place, well, they didn't change the name of the place, they just shut it down. But for you to do that, just because someone, you know, went missing, it's weird. But anyway, but yeah, that, that that's a very weird voicemail, you know, but like I said, he sounded like he was in some severe pain. It was all this moaning and groaning, you know, and then you hear a growl, but yet, when they find his body, there was no sign of torture on his body at all. So they have, an, they have the ability to make you experience severe pain from the inside out. And then when you finally die from all that, I guess, I guess from the trauma, you, that's it. That's how they did it. But they can always do it without any evidence being found. No fingerprints, no footprints, no nothing. You know, so that's just my opinion. You know, it's got to be something so ominous and so evil. You know, we just, it's just something that we, can, we can't stop. And I think that could be the reason why the park service doesn't say anything, because they can't do anything about it. They can't stop it. So what's the point of even trying to let you know what's really going on? Just like with the um, uh, Dennis Martin story. They did the same thing to him. They would never tell him what was going on, you know? And he died a, a, a unhappy man. He was still married to his wife, but he died an unhappy man because he had to live the rest of his life without his son being by his side and leave with the fact that the Park Service and the FBI and whoever else was involved in the case of trying to find his son lied to him completely. You know, so you won't see me going to any national parks or any forests. I can't even go in my backyard because like there's like a large line of trees that lead all the way back to the next subdivision. I don't even like going back there because of, because of what might happen to me, you know. <laughs> and, I, and I live in the house, you know. But anyway, that's all I got for right now. I have some more stories for you. So always imparting aloha, mahalo, and the hui which also means to meet again in Hawaii. So peace.